Welcome class, this is going to be uh, a chapter one uh, review. So we're going to go over some of the key terms and key figures here in chapter one for you. All right, and we're going to start off with what is psychology. Psychology is really the study of science, behavior, and mental processes. All right, uh, we're interested in more talking about what, what a science is. Science is something that we can measure. Okay, when we think of terms like the mind, the mind is really kind of an intangible. It's nothing that we can kind of touch or measure, but we can measure things like mental processes, how long it takes you to think, how long it takes you to re recall information, uh, how long it takes you to complete a task. So that's where we're kind of uh, approaching the field of psychology from, things that are, are measurable. All right, so what do psychologists do? 34% uh, of psychologists today are involved in an are employed in an academic setting. Okay, they're teachers at a university. Uh, they're engaging in research. Uh, roughly 12% are in the industrial field, industrial or business. Uh, these are positions such as human resources, uh, administrative positions, or industrial organizational or I/O psychologists. Uh, these psychologists usually go in and can tell companies that they can uh, hire more effectively or more efficiently. They can streamline employees' productivity better. And oftentimes this is doing things like using these, uh, many of you have probably taken when you went in to apply for a job or gone through an interview process, you've uh, filled out some kind of personality questionnaire. I like to be inside, uh, I like to work with my hands, I like people, uh, th certain questions like that. These are questions to determine if your personality is a fit for the job description that you've been applying for. And the intention is so the, the employer doesn't hire the wrong person, have to fire you, rehire you, it's a very expensive process, um, or just you're gonna hire a person who doesn't like what they're gonna do, you're gonna quit and they have to go through that same process. Okay, that's what industrial organizational psychologists do. 24% uh, uh, of psychologists are employed in a clinical setting. They're employed by behavioral health organizations uh, mental health clinics, community health, mental health centers, uh, outpatient clinics, uh, or home-based care services. And about 22% of psychologists are a private practice. Myself, I fit into many of these. Uh, you know, I'm a private practitioner. I have my own independent practice as a marriage and family therapist. Um, I certainly work in an academic setting, obviously. Um, I do consulting work for companies on employees and productivity. A uh, very little portion of my business. Uh, and I certainly work with, not for, uh, behavioral health organizations, state grant, uh, which is basically community mental health centers. Um, so I kind of fit into all those, as, as, many, as many psychologists or therapists or behavioral mental health practitioners do today. All right, historical figures you're going to want to know, and these are just some highlights. Please read more about these uh, figures in your book. You will want to know the name William Wundt. Okay, William Wundt is is uh, given credit for being the uh, giving the foundation of psychology into uh, making psychology a science, and he does that but again uh, when we're talking about what a science is. A science is something that's measurable, uh, something we can observe, observable behavior, and uh, he certainly gave credit to that and he laid the foundation for academic principles of psychology. Okay, and he was the first to record an experiment uh, to record the mental processes. And what he did is he had a telegraph and he was asking somebody to hear a certain thought or hear a certain word or see a, a certain object and then they had to hit this telegraph button so he could actually physically measure uh, how long it took a thought to become a behavior. Uh, and basically that's what it was. Again, I want you to read more about William Wundt and structuralism in the book. The next guy that came on is uh, William James, uh, where William Wundt was a structuralist. William James, William James changed the game and went into functionalism. If William Wundt was the uh, what, then William James was the why uh, when it comes to uh, how we think. Uh, he was focused on, uh, William James was focused on the purpose the purpose of structures, okay? So he's focused on the adaptive qualities and the benefits of the mind. 
he saw the mind as some kind of fluid and flexible uh, thing. It certainly wasn't some rigid fixed fixture. Uh, and this was based on a lot of the uh, uh, Charles Darwin, which is the natural selection, kind of the evolutionary perspective of psychology, kind of that mindset. Uh, the different approaches to psychology, and there are many, here are some of the basic ones and some of the more prevalent ones. There's the biological approach. The biological approach is exactly what it sounds like. It's focused on the, the brain and central nervous system. Um, uh, it's neurology, uh, focusing on a neuron. We're going to get into that in Chapter 2. Uh, the behavioral approach, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about this. I am a behavioral therapist within the field of psychology. Okay, and this is uh, really where the, the, the crux or the, the um, great portion of my work is done as from a behavioral approach, a behavioral approach. And really what that is, it approaches psychology and thinking and behavior and uh, behavior modification from what we call the black box approach. The black box is right here. Okay, if you drew a kind of, we don't care what's going on between your ears. There's a lot, we acknowledge that there's a thought process but we say that it's relatively unimportant when it comes to shaping behavior. Uh, we're going to get into historical figures like uh, uh, Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov was a Russian uh, scientist, and he's uh, credited with classical conditioning. We'll talk about that more. Classical conditioning is the pairing of two or more stimuli. You've probably heard of he's drooling like Pavlov's dog. That's him. We're going to talk more about that in Chapter 2. Next in behavioral came B.F. Skinner. Very important uh, historical figure. Uh, he was gave birth to what we call operant conditioning. And operant conditioning says it's basically reinforcement or rewarding behavior. Um, I can increase the likelihood that you're going to repeat a particular behavior by giving you uh, incentive. Okay. One is conscious, a uh, conscious thought process, and one is not. Classical conditioning is not conscious thought. Uh, operant conditioning is. We'll talk again more about these later. Another approach to psychology is the psychodynamic. This is Sigmund Freud. You've probably heard a lot about Sigmund Freud um, in the past, but Sigmund Freud was uh, gave birth to what we call talk therapy, and we'll start talking about therapies much, much later in the book. But Sigmund Freud was uh, interested in conscious, unconscious thought, uh, unresolved conflict, social demands, uh, early childhood experiences, and he had his own... Um, uh, stages of uh, what we call the psychosexual stages of development. We'll get into that later as well. Next came the humanistic approach to psychology. This is where we see the focuses on the positive uh, and adaptive qualities of the human race and individuals. Uh, there's the capacity for growth, freedom for an individual's choice to help shape their own future, and focuses on a concept called altruism. If we can embody altruism, this is kind of the Mother Teresa, the Gandhi. This is doing for others for certainly no benefit and oftentimes a sacrifice to yourself, but doing something good for the, the sake of doing something good. All right. Uh, there's evolutionary psychology. Uh, this is kind of the Darwin theory, the adaptation, natural selectiveness, the, the inherent aggressiveness and fear, uh, the instinctual drives that we all have for survival, such as mating patterns, um, sex, like I said, sex, fear, and aggressiveness. Okay, sociocultural, probably the, one of the uh, fastest growing aspects and approaches that we're, uh, to, to our, our culture here in the United States since we have such a multicultural um, uh, society. There's so many different influences from so many different cultures all over the world. And this sociocultural psychology focuses on the, the important social constructs and, and cultural influences that do shape our behavior and how we influence one another, how different cultures influence one another, or even uh, uh, you know, disagree or, or fight. Uh, cognitive psychology is probably, cognitive psychology or cognitive behavioral psychology is probably the most prevalent form of therapy or widely uh, researched, the most widely researched form of psychology today. When we say cognitive or cognition, that simply means how we think. So. Cognitive psychologists study how we direct our attention, perceive, remember, recall information, learn, plan, set goals, and be creative. Those are the things that cognitive psychologists are interested on, the thought process. Okay. 
It's important that you understand the scientific method. I'm not going to go over all of that right now. I'm going to go over the five steps. You will need to know the five stages and the order in which they come. But I want you to read more about this uh, on the PowerPoints and in your book. Uh, the scientific method is I have to observe a phenomenon. I have to see something that kind of draws a question in me. Wow, I wonder what it would be like if. Okay, and that's the second part. So one, I have to observe a phenomena. Two, I have to formulate a hypothesis and make a prediction. Uh, the third thing I have to do is I have to test in a, in a very specific way. I have to test uh, my hypothesis or my guess. Then I have to draw conclusions based on the research and the data that I've gathered. And then I have to evaluate my conclusions. What do I think about this? And then part of that is presenting your findings in an academic way. Okay, so please read more about that in the book. Uh, there's different ways that we can uh, do research. Okay, I, I, Jean Piaget, and we'll certainly get into him later, uh, said there's direct observation. That's how we that's how we gather information simply by watching. Power of observation. There's also surveys or, or interviews. Okay, I can give you a, a self-report and have you tell me what's going on. Uh, I can just ask you as, a, as an interview style. I can give you a questionnaire to complete. I can gather information that way, uh, which is probably one of the more common ways to do it. Uh, we can do case studies. Case studies is research that's done. It's not done in, in, in essence. Uh, it's not done with the intention of globalizing results because you can't do that with a one-person study. But I can take one particular person, let's say if I'm studying schizophrenia, but I can take one particular person and I can really get in depth like I can't with that one person that I can't do with, you know, 1,500 test subjects. It's just cost prohibitive and time prohibitive. All right. Uh, there's great value of descriptive research, okay, and can help explain how and why things are the way that they are, okay. There's two key concepts you need to understand the difference between, okay, and one of those terms is called correlation, and one of those terms is causation. Causation is exactly what it sounds like. If I do A, then B will happen every time. That is a cause, okay? I, I, I have a pin, I stick it in my hand, that is going to cause me pain every time I do it. Uh, so that would be causation. Correlation would be something like the longer I study, the better I do on my tests. Now, one does not cause the other because we've all studied for exams at some point probably where you study 10 or 12 hours for a test and you still vomit. Okay, so the longer you study did not cause you to do better on the test. However, when we look at students, generally speaking, in a class, I can see that on mass, more, the more students study, the better they tend to do on an exam. One does not cause the other, but there certainly is a relationship between those two. That's what correlation is, okay? Correlation is not causation. Probably pretty good for the, you to understand that for a test question. Correlation is not causation. All right, please read more about that in your book. Experimental research. This is where I've got two groups, okay? And I'm gonna use my example to explain experimental research. I have developed uh, a, a, what I think is a, is a groundbreaking new pill to cure headaches, okay? So I've got my pill here, but before I can take this and, and put it out on the market and start making wild claims like, this is the greatest headache pill uh, since Bayer, uh, I've gotta test it. I've gotta have some research and I've gotta have some data behind me. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take two groups of people. This is a very general statement, just so you can understand. I'm gonna take two groups of people. I've got 50 people in this group. I've got 50 people in this group that have been randomly assigned to these groups. They all, 100 of these people, all report that they have their chronic headache sufferers. Okay, so for there, they haven't been divided, men over here, women over here, random assignment into these two groups. One group is called my control group. One group is called my experimental group. My control group, I'm going to give them a placebo or a sugar pill. In other words, I'm not doing anything to them, okay? I'm just giving them a pill so they think they're getting this headache pill. Let's say they have a pain scale from one to 10. One is no headache, 10 is, a, is an, inc an incredibly painful uh, headache. 
And so before the exam, uh, they, they, most of them rate that they have a 9 or a 10. Uh, after the experiment has, has been completed, I ask this control group who I've really done nothing for, I ask them how their headache is. They still say it's really bad. It's still a 9 or a 10. Great. That's what it should be because I haven't done anything to them. My experimental group, however, I have given my new miracle pill to. So I asked them the same question before the, the research, I, or before the, the research project. I say, how was your headache? And they say it was a 9 or a 10. I give them the pill. After the experiment, I ask them how their headache was. Now they report that their headache has gone down to a 2 or a 3. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. Okay, I, I, heard, I gave the, the two equally, uh, uh, as, as equal groups as I could possibly have. One I did nothing to. One I, I gave my pill to and I've got the results that I'm looking for. Now I can go out and kind of uh, determine if I can globalize those results and say that my pill is, is, is awesome, okay? There's, there's two concepts. You under, need to understand what validity is and you need to understand what reliability is, okay? So validity, there's two types of validity. There's internal and external validity. Internal validity says, are the results of my experiment what I'm intending to measure? So at the end of my experiment, what I'm really trying to measure before I go in and start anything is, does my headache pill work? So the outcome of this experiment should be, did their pain tolerance go down? My questions better have something to do with the pain tolerance, all right? Or their pain level, rather. External validity means, after I'm done with my experiment, can I take the, the, the results of this study and can I globalize this to other populations? So. If I'm trying to say that this headache pill is awesome, I can't just take, for everybody, I can't just take people from Indianapolis in my study. I've got to take, men, I have to make sure there's men in there, I've got to make sure there's women in there, I've got to make sure I test my pill in New York and Florida and San Diego and kind of everywhere. Uh, everybody's had an equal chance uh, uh, to uh, participate in my study. Maybe the, if I just test people here in Indy, Maybe the weather is influencing um, the prevalence of headaches. Yeah, it could be a number of factors, okay? So, <clears throat> whenever we're talking about generalizing research, any research samples to, to uh, globalize our results to population in the United States, really what we're talking about is about 1,500 test subjects. Not a whole lot more and not a whole lot less. That's kind of a magic number. Whenever you're seeing a, a, a poll on, uh, you know, pre the presidential race or some kind of, uh, you know, if they're trying to say, oh, you know, Mr. Smith is running for the state senate and he's going again against uh, Mrs. White, and uh, you know, Mr. Smith is is ahead, you know, 48 percent or uh, you know, 52 percent to 48 percent. They're sampling about 1,500 people in their study to be able to globalize that result. Right. Understand the different research settings, okay? There's naturalistic research settings. So if I'm studying children's behavior on how they are on the playground, uh, one of the things I can do is I can go out and watch kids uh, on a playground, certainly with the consent of the school, obviously nothing creepy going on there. Uh, so I'm watching the kids uh, in, a, in a natural environment. They don't know they're being watched. Uh, I'm, uh, but I'm studying their behavior and I get a very accurate sample of what kids really do. Um, the limitation of that is that I can't really manipulate that in a naturalistic setting. I just kind of have to watch what naturally occurs. If I'm doing it in a clinic or a laboratory, uh, the good news is, is I can set certain conditions. I can increase the temperature to see if that affects people's behavior. I can limit what uh, toys the kids have access to. Uh, I can, there's a, just a million different things that I can manipulate in a clinical setting. Problem is, when you're in my clinic, you know you're in my clinic, so you know I'm studying, uh, I'm studying you, so you tend to behave a little bit more unnaturally. Uh, when we're talking about uh, research, uh, there is what we call an IRB, or an Informational Review Board. Uh, I can't just go out and start doing research willy-nilly. The IRB uh, the Informational Review Board exists for the sole purpose of protecting the public from me. So I have to submit informed consent, things like confidentiality. Um, 
I have to debrief people that are in my research, and I can't deceive somebody. Okay, I can't tell somebody that they're coming in for an addiction study and then scare the living bejesus out of them and really be studying fear. Can't do that. If I'm studying fear, I've got to tell them I'm studying fear. Before I can do any research, I have to submit everything in great detail from how I'm going to uh, submit, uh, how I'm going to obtain information, how I'm going to protect confidentiality of my, the, the people in my study, how I'm going to debrief them, how I'm going to uh, make sure that they're not being deceived or harmed in any way in this research. I have to submit all that to this informational review board. It's a panel of people that get together and will approve or not approve my research. Uh, and again, they protect uh, the public against any researchers or unethical or illegal activity. All right, that's it for chapter one. Uh, I will be posting chapter two soon.